So yes, hello folks, welcome to the weekly Matches Night Report. I'm the host is always Phil Brown. Join with my regular co-host, uh, excellent James Rhodes here, of course. It's Tuesday, the day after. He made it play Palace in what was rather predictable catastrophe and collapse and surrender. Um, how you doing, mate? Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um <laughs> I think it's yeah. It does. It's it's almost it's a little bit sad that things like yesterday don't particularly bother me much anymore. Because when you know something's going to happen and it happens, you're a little more prepared for it, I guess. Yeah, but you know what? The, the, the thing is, is that we're going into these games that I didn't expect anything. And the thing is, why why shouldn't we expect something? Why shouldn't we be expecting yeah. United to be capable of at least going and competing against Crystal Palace? I didn't even have that. Yeah expectation and you know i'm reminded of a, a tweet i put out a while ago saying just for once i'd like to be able to watch united for 90 minutes without shaking my head in disbelief it's in, in, in every week <clears throat> it's <clears throat> mistakes that lead to goals that uh truly defy belief at this level um i think there's a lot of things wrong um i don't think anyone comes out of this well um players staff in the football club as a whole um you know when i watch united it, it, it really does defy belief how bad they are it does it because you know this is a, a crystal palace team i think one of our only good performances of the whole season was that win against them in the cup run early on and it was probably our only kind of complete performance of the of the whole year that I recall um, that still stands out all the way back you know seven months ago now I think it was eight months maybe and to go in there and act like that and and put the kind of performance in that they do it's I, I honestly think that was probably the worst game I've watched for United in, in my lifetime quite frankly I don't think it was a, 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 a sport for choice here um, yeah. <laughs> uh, there was so few things for me that was worse than Basics a here away. I think that was bad. Um, <clears throat> I think the uh, 5 0 at home for Liverpool was bad. There's been some city games that have just been horrendous, but at least you can talk about that being top opposition. Not yeah. Here, but, that's that's you know, why, you know. <laughs> we're, we're okay, you know, we're not on that level. Um, but to see what. You know, against Crystal Palace away. Um, I mean, you're essentially looking at a football team that's flatlined, that have really no interest in going out and competing and trying to win games. Yeah. You know, it looked to me like that team had decided to lose that game before they took the field. Because, look, I, I, I think there's certain things that obviously you can blame Ten Hag for, and, and we'll get to that. Um, and it does seem like every one of these podcasts now we're talking about what's going to happen with Ten Hag, but the only way he can address that <clears throat> is by winning games of football and winning them with um, you know, some convincing margins um, that give people hope for something there to believe in. And I have been one of his, I want to say staunchest defenders, but certainly someone that he's tried to be balanced and reasoned with him and not blame him on a lot of things that I think aren't his fault, but the, the statistics, and I don't like judging people on statistics, but statistics are horrendous things. They are, and I think that probably the biggest problem that you have right now, when I look at yesterday in particular, um, that's not a team full of players from the last manager. Um, it's one thing if it is, but you know there were seven players on there. He signed. And when I say he signed, it's, I'm not talking about blaming him for the recruitment problems. I'm saying these are not players who, who you know, sometimes you'll see they say, oh, these guys got, you know, Solskjaer sacked or these guys got Mourinho sacked or something like that. Um, they didn't, you know. Casemiro wasn't there. Uh, Evans wasn't there. Um, I think the only player on the pitch for the entire game who actually played under the prior manager regularly was Juan Bissaka because Dalla was on loan most of Solskjaer's period of time. And I think the, the problem with it is, is it's um, is for all of them is that how is it that seven players arrive on, on there? 
emergency things like Johnny Evans, who I, I won't fault him for because he also wasn't fit. He wasn't, he, you know, shouldn't have been relied on as much as he, he would be. And he wasn't even cleared to play the full game. Um, but either way, you have seven players out there you've signed and you bring on, I think, one more in Amrabat as a, as a sub who look like they don't care, who look like they're not interested in winning the game, that look like they completely lack belief. Um, those are players that have come in in the last two summers. And for them to already be in that position is a really bad sign for everybody involved in this. Yeah. Yeah, look, I can't disagree with what it look, how they look like they're taking the field. They look like they're going through the motions in games. Um, I would say a few things. Yes, you know, there's a number of centers on that field that were ten hogs, and I'm by no means a keen um exculpating him. Um but <clears throat> as you quite rightly pointed out, you know, one of them's Johnny Evans. You know, he yeah. was brought in as an emergency centre back. He now has no fit centre backs, which is just beyond belief to me. Um it's hard to blame him on that. Um, you know, obviously Maguire was overplayed because he had to be. Um Johnny Evans was asked to play despite feeling a fitness test as he will always choose to do because he's a consummate professional yeah. he did not sure you can expect him to come in and be at the peak of his powers you know having not played and having you know played through a field fitness test um one thing that i do scratch my head at is the insistence of playing wan Bissaka on the left uh, wan Bissaka is not the best tactical football in the world <clears throat> on the right um, playing him on the left. I mean, if you watch what happens when he gets the ball, he, even when he has the opportunity, he's not putting the ball on his left foot. Mm. He comes yeah. back in on his right foot every time. So the, the, the attack breaks down um, and inevitably he cuts back into trouble. Hoyland doesn't get a ball across the box. The attack breaks down and it is so unbalanced. It's ridiculous. Casemiro Maybe the worst place you want to put him right now is in the centre back, um, because he doesn't have pace, and you can see yeah. he doesn't want to play there. And him being judged on being playing a centre back is a bit harsh. Um, but I said this. I'm last not sure time. he was any better in the midfield this year. <laughs> but I think that you're talking about a guy, James. That yeah, I look like look at a guy that is questioning his decisions. Oh yeah, because, absolutely. So yeah, he's never finished outside the top four in his career. At you know, going, we're sitting in eighth position here. Um, I'm not motivated to qualify for the Europa Conference League. You know, just get me out of here. Um, yeah. I, I look at Christian Eriksen in the midfield on a free transfer. You know, is he really, should he be in your midfield? Probably not. Uh, Mason Mount, who still to me looks, I have no idea where, where he plays. Uh. Um, you know, Anthony hauled off again after 60 minutes. <clears throat> um, not long after Palace's third goal, I think it was. Yeah, uh, and just a few minutes he, after, you know, petulantly screaming at his teammates after he gave the ball away again. Yeah. Um, and, well uh, caught. <laughs> yeah, and so you just, you look at it and you go, I I, I don't see a single positive. I mean, Onana, mm -hmm. I thought, was suspect on at least one of the goals yesterday. Yeah. Um, I think he maybe should have done better getting beat as near post, although I've seen that happen a few times. I've seen Sonny do it with, with Bayern a few times too. Um, when those balls are hitting up really fast like that, <clears throat> it can be hard to see it. But can't and you can't it. blame him for the performance of the of the game, you know, even though he, he oh, could do better on a few goals, you know. You can see, you know, Manu's levels are dropping, his yes. energy levels are dropping in midfield. Um, I think if I'm honest. Maybe Manu could have done more to get back. Um, was it the first goal that uh, Paul scored where he went straight through? Um, yeah. Well, he say he sort of jogs three quarter pace back. <laughs> and uh, no, I mean I'm being honest with you. They think he maybe I know a bit more. I'm looking at him going, I like yeah. that. the kid's unbelievable. Maybe it's energy levels, and maybe it's just complete misalignment of goals between players, the club. I don't know, but this is a this is as bad as it's ever been. And maybe this is was always how it was going to end with the days of tenure was with this much turnover in the last couple of months, it was always going to be rock bottom. But um, 
James, this is a really difficult position for anyone else to be in because they're going to have to make decisions whether they want to make them or not. Yeah, and that's kind of the the challenge with this, you know, is is that obviously, you know, when they came in, they were going to say, look, we're, we're going to start from the top. We're going to replace our executives. We're going to move down the entire United structure. And then the last thing we want to address is the manager because – I think we've talked about this on this podcast. They were going to give him the season pretty much no matter what. Um, that was their view. That was their direction. He's going to get the year because ideally they would have hoped you could turn things around uh, and get back into a good position where you have some decent justification in case you do keep him for the next season and say, okay, well, there's some positives to take away from this. Um, they've done everything else. Everyone else is gone. I mean, literally everyone else is gone. I spoke to somebody around United recently and it was like, <laughs> it was very funny because they basically said between Enios and Ten Hag, there isn't anything. <laughs> That's it. It's Enios or it's Ten Hag at this point, you know, in terms of who's in there in any position of, of any meaning. Um, so it's, that's it. It's all done. It's all replaced. And, you know, now this is where the focus unfortunately has to be. And like you said, we end up talking about it every week because unfortunately it gets worse every week, the situation. And and also, unfortunately, we're no closer to any public sort of clarification on the situation. So it becomes a topic. Um, I think we could assume that uh, at the same time, it's a, it's a sort of a lose-lose when, when it starts going this way, right? Because... Um, you know, if they're not 100% convinced on Ten Hag staying, and I think you'd be a fool to assume that they're certain of Ten Hag staying next year right now, then if they say he's gone, it's the same thing as letting him go, you know, from a player perspective, from a team perspective, from all of that. And you have to wonder, what does it do? I mean, it's quite clear there's a lot of players who believe he'll be gone at the end of the season. Uh, How is that affecting things? We don't know. Um, but you can't tell him he's going to be there for sure next year either. Um, a lot of those players are going to be asking about their futures, asking about what comes next. You've got, uh, as I said, you know, the part of the problem with that seven players that he signed, whether they are good players or should be here or not, is I think every single one of them is going to be asking, aside from maybe Rasmus Hoyland, asking what the plan is next season. If I'm Mason Mount, I just arrived. Oh, you didn't ask me a question. Yeah, because I'm wondering with Mason Mount, I don't even know how I fit this year. Different manager comes in. What? Where am I fitting next yeah. year? Bruno Fernandez is still at this point. No, Did really... I just a- arrive to to be sitting on the bench behind the guy who's missed one game via injury in his entire career? Because that's not a position any player will ever want to be in ever. Um, there's a lot of problems, and and I'm sure that's affecting things. And unfortunately, I don't think it changes much if they were to say today, Ten Hag's going or Ten Hag's staying, those questions are still going to be there. Um, but they have to, they have to, they have to kind of follow through on that, um, on their decisions and, and play it out now because it's, it's May 7th uh, when we're recording this. The season is, as far as the league goes, has effectively been over and Champions League qualification has been done for a while. Um, the FA Cup will determine with an unlikely game against City whether they get into probably Europa or not because now we're below Chelsea in the table for eighth. Mm-hmm. So it, it's looking unlikely that there's any kind of European qualification on the table. Uh, they can't wait any longer, and uh, and I don't think that they will necessarily in terms of executing their their plans, but um, I can certainly see it's it's very frustrating probably for players, for fans, for everybody to look at the situation and have it hang in limbo. Um, you know, it yeah, is frustrating. This is where, you know, and he also had a bunch of free hits so far. You know, they've been mm-hmm. able to um, appoint people in positions that are easy, that are <clears throat> all wins, easy to do. Um, now comes the real decisions that they're going to be judged on. And... There was, this is where they're going to have to provide some leadership for the football club that they wanted to take over. And this is where the uh, the real work begins. This is yes. where you really start to judge any else. And they either need to come out and back Ten Hag 
or they need to say that they're sacking him. But the limbo is really unhealthy for him to do his job. And uh, I don't think it's good for players. And I don't think it's fair to fans. So I think that uh, you look at other clubs, you look at Bayern, you look at Barcelona, even Liverpool. It's okay to see your managers leave at the end of the season. And I would, if I'm Ten Hag and Bayern are interested in me, I'm going. Because, first of all, for Ten Hag, he would get everything he's not getting at United in terms of setup, players, you know. And it's, to be fair, no disrespect to Germany, but it's a great football club to try to rebuild your reputation if you've had a bad spell at Manchester United. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you choose to stay at Manchester United that's, a, that's in total chaos and not go to Bayern, then you can't complain about the conditions you work in because you've decided to accept them. Um, I just I don't understand to me how this helps not saying anything because uh, you know this is where any of us really have to show um, the quality of their leadership and big people get paid big money to make decisions that nobody else wants to make mm-hmm. and you can't not make it for fear of getting it wrong because it's very easy James to dismantle the system that we have. But rebuilding a successful one, that's that's going to be difficult. And yeah. I don't think any of us have a lot of obvious answers to the question, who replaces Ten Hag? And I don't think they have anyone they're completely confident in. And these are decisions they can't get wrong. Because next season is going to be a very difficult season for whoever's there. I mean, I don't know how United can go out and recruit top players that are going to be wanted by other top clubs and not be in Europe. Yeah, it's a it is a problem, and I definitely you know agree with you on that. Um, I don't see how it helps to not make a decision. That being said, <laughs> this is where there's obviously a little bit of a difference. Um, in terms of maybe what's around and what's out there. Um, And the only thing that I would say on this is I feel pretty certain that, you know, we're obviously seeing a bit of a new, you know, a totally new regime, right? A totally new way of doing everything compared to the Glazers in the past and compared to everything in the past. And one of the hallmarks, I think of it so far on the executive front is silence. Um, They're really quiet. You know, the Omar Barada thing was done the day it was reported, right? He was he became the next CEO the day it was reported. Murtaugh was gone in an instant after feeling like he might have a role under the new regime. Um, these were not decisions that were made that day. Uh, there's obviously a difference between when Ineos decide to do something and when anyone hears about it. And by nature of them being much more isolated from, you know, the club in many ways, this may change over the years after their 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 men are in there and you get a different story, you know, with Wilcox in there once Ashworth is in there and they're there every single day and they're operating on these decisions, then sure, you it might change in the future to where you're, you're seeing leaks again because it's almost inevitable of a business that size that you're going to have leaks and things. Um, but for the moment, the Ineos leadership are very isolated from the club, from leaks, from things like that. We saw it through the whole takeover where I would say the majority of media, including very top journalists, had it uh, at financial outlets and things, had it wrong, had it totally wrong and did not know really all that was going on through that period of time. And that's not an insult to them. It's just the nature of the way that, uh, that Ineos do business. You're talking about people who are maybe a lot more serious than you're used to with football people, right? Um, from a business perspective. And so they do things differently. That being said, you know, one of the things they'll obviously have to learn, maybe they care, maybe they don't in some respect um, about uh, fan sentiment in, in certain regards, because I, I don't think it's going to influence their decisions on anything. Um to some degree, obviously, demand for knowing now what is happening with the manager. Uh, if they know what they're doing and they're already operating on it and they're already going ahead with it, to some degree, it doesn't really matter if they tell people or not, if they tell anyone or not. 
Um, I go back and forth on that, obviously, as a fan. You know what I mean? Because I would like to, uh, you know, I would like to to everybody to know what's going on. And I think it's it's fair when you see the kind of um, difficulty, the kind of problems that we're seeing. Um, that uh, you know that people can can have some idea of what's going on in the future, and they want to be informed. And I think there's good ways of of doing that. And you know, one of the things that I do note is just that you know they've really quickly come out to say Ten Hag won't be sacked before the FA Cup final. Right? That's gone everywhere today. Um, six, seven outlets, things like that. It's a very. It's a. That's the line. You don't get the same line about after the season. You never have um, about any sort of, of certainty there. Um, but I guess my point being is it is is it's obviously their view is we don't want to say that Eric Tanag is being sacked I, for whatever reason. They definitely don't want to say that if that's what they've decided. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is where I maybe diverge. First of all, you can move with style when it comes to backroom appointments. Mm -hmm. There's no one really yeah. pays attention. You know, you, you, yeah. you, you move a CFO, so what? And no one really cares about that. You put people in positions that they never had someone in there before, so what? You know, yeah. you want to bring move out Darren Fletcher, you're not gonna you're not gonna make a big difference. But when it comes to the manager, yeah, and Hogs uh, success or continued success or and even any else to some degree is going to very much depend on fan sentiment. And I would caution any of us from removing fan sentiment from the equation when deciding mm -hmm. what to do. And, yeah. you know, United are impossible to keep leaks from, especially when you're talking about other people involved in that discussion. So, you know, any of us are moving in stealth, but today there's reports that they're not going to stack Ten Hag till the end of the season. That obviously came from somewhere. Um, yeah. But even then, so what? I mean, mm -hmm. even if Ten Hag wins the next you know, four, three or four games, the next few league games, and then the cup final, you're basing your decision on that. You know, yeah, whatever I, decision you arrive at today, you should be at the same decision, no matter what happens in the next few games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to me, it's like, um, if you've decided that you're going to sack Ten Hag, why can't they say it? You know, what's the, what's the, what's, what, what's the negative? You know, well, like, I, I, you could give I, I, that option to Ken Hagen and say, look, because he's going to want those assurances too. And you can't yeah. turn around and do what they did with Van Hall and not say anything. Go after another manager like they did in Mourinho. Van Hall knew you know, they were going after Mourinho months before they did because I spoke with um, his assistant. And it deeply affected how they went about the job the last two months. And so... Um, and the relationship with the club and how they pursue players and what players were going to stay, what players were going to go. Um, and uh, you would have to say you need to badly handle that really, really badly. These are the mm. things that you're going to get judged on. If any of us have made a decision about Ten Hag, didn't, didn't say it. So this is where you have to have balls. Mm. You know, if I made a decision about Thomas Tuchel, they're still in the Champions League semi final. They yeah. said it. You know, why can't and he wants to do the same thing. To me, it's a bit cowardly to sit and hide behind anonymity, uh, 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 silence, and not yeah. say anything. Because in some sense, the silence is worse than not saying something. And you know, it, it, you need to have some bravery. To me, this is where you really start to impose yourself and show that this is why we have quality people making quality decisions. Mm -hmm. And I know Jason Wilcox just got there, Dan Ishworth's not there yet, but you still have to be able to operate as a football club and make key decisions whether Ishworth's there or not. And to me, yep. it's like, how much more information do you need? need? If they how much more it, are you going to get? You know, yeah, like, uh, never, it's, we, yeah, I'm really with you on that. Yeah. The end of the season. I don't expect yeah. United all of a sudden to come out against Arsenal and play Berlin and, you know, mm -hmm. win the FA Cup. It'll be exactly the same as what we're seeing right now between now and the end of the season. Mm -hmm. I agree. And and look, I actually agree with 100% of the of the points that you've, uh, you've made there. You know, um, as far as I would say, I believe they have reached a decision from from one side of it i i am concerned that 
by not putting it out, if they're leaving the door open to change it in case something happens or they, you know, I, I don't like that approach to it well, it's, because, it's, 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 uh, yeah, I don't it's, think it's, I, I know, and that does bother me. Like if they don't follow through on what I'm pretty certain of their decision is, it would worry me a bit because I would say, why? You know, why would they have not followed through on that? And to me, it would be mostly down to a failure to operate effectively and do the things that need to be done. I mean, let's say they had decided to sack Tanag and they get to the end of the season, and then they don't. Well, why didn't you say you were going to keep him two months ago then yeah. and put it to bed? You know, why didn't you say that and make it more certain and make sure the players know that the manager is going to be there for the rest of the year? You know, you would have gotten more from them. You would have gotten more stability, all of that, if you'd said that. So if you're going to keep them, you, they absolutely should have said it. And, this is and to me, right, exactly, because there's no downside to saying Ten Hag will stay if yes. you're intending to keep them. There's no right. downside. There's only pluses. You give your, yourself a chance at, at Europe, a better chance. You, you, you put a little bit more authority in his name. Um, with the players who are there. So if you're not going to say that, then you get to the end of the season and you do keep him, then you're telling me you're only doing so because you essentially bottled a replacement that you wanted. And I think that would be a failure too. And that doesn't set anybody up for success. And so, you know, it is, it's, a, it's, it's, it's tricky. I, I wish they would come out and have, have said certain things. I really do. Um, I still think they'll end up doing what, kind of expect them to do uh in which case fine they if they stick with their decision um the only thing that would have been better is to just have made it clear ahead of time but um i think they'll you know i, I can if I, the only kind of let off i can give on it is of course that um they haven't been in there that long you know two and a half months is not a long time in football mm. but it's long enough you know they've been planning for a long time they've gotten their executives in they've they gotten their people they in They've been affecting the seasons that you know. You're oh, right, yeah. Under the desk, but they've been affecting the seasons you know for a while. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, Brailsford's pretty much been in there since Christmas. Yeah. Right? That's why I don't see how they're going to know anything else. He's been there for five months now. It's what else are they going to learn? What, what, you, you, you're gonna, what are you going to learn over the next two or three weeks if you don't know right now? Yeah. And to me, it's like, um, you know, you, even if you bring in two goals, Right. Mm -hmm. Let's just go with the obvious choice. Thomas Tuchel comes in. Um, that's just the easy part. Then the mm -hmm. hard part comes about yeah. getting that guy the type of players that he needs and the squad that he needs to be successful. Because yeah. even at the start of the season, next season, he's going to have nothing like a Bayern Munich squad or a PSG squad. Um, yeah. I mean, I just, I really wonder how you need to go about their business this summer. Um, and how they convince players to come to the football club that other top players will want, top clubs will want to can offer them much more. I mean, this is yeah. you need to have to be really, really shrewd this summer in going after players that are not quite top of the market, that are just beneath the market. You're going to have to really research, uh, do your homework on, and be shrewd about how you go about getting those players. But even that market is really, really competitive because that's the market that. You know, the Atletico Madrid's are in, the Italian clubs are in, you know, these are you know, because they can't buy at the very top either. And the youth market is really competitive because everyone's trying to get the best young players because no one has the money anymore. So it's, you know, you need to have people in place that understand what they're doing, that have a very clear vision of what they want and are already pursuing those targets. I know we hear about Olisi and everything, we'll get to him, but, um, but beyond that, um, you're talking about, you know, United will need, for me, maybe six, seven signs mm. this summer. And yeah. that is all derivative of who's the manager. Because yeah. the manager will have a say, even if they don't have complete say, they're going to have to be consulted yeah. on this. Of course. Um, I, it just seems to me so much work to do in such a short period of time. I, I just don't know how they do it. Yeah, and and obviously, like I said, there, there is a let off in that. You know, the reason we're in this situation is not, you know, indecisiveness over the last two or three months, but uh, <laughs> mismanagement for for ten to twenty years, right? Um, and we're kind of at the at the end of that. Um, but there is a lot to do, and so you know, obviously, 
the quicker they finalize and, and say that manager thing, the better, because that is a big piece of this whole puzzle that has to go together that has to, with all the work that's being done. And, and I think it's more frustrating in that regard, like, like we've, we've said not to go on and on about it, but you know, it would be good to have some finality on that one way or another, just on one big thing. So we know where we're going, you know, moving forward. And I'm really fine with whatever is decided, you know, however it lays out, but, um, it's more important to me that they do a proper process than it is what the outcome of that process is. Because if you're changing your mind at the last minute, I don't think that's a good process. You know, I don't think that's a good way of doing things. Um, so, you know, that's that side of it. But as you say, there's, there's a whole lot that has to be done, you know, elsewhere too um, with the manager, but even to get to, to buys, to, to get to transfers in, we know that they have to have quite a number of transfers out because finances are, are a problem. The wage bill is high. There's probably going to be no Europe. The, it means the revenues are certainly going to be lower. It's less games, less prize money, less TV money, less ticket money, all of that. Um, and they're going to have to sell really well in order to fund the number of moves it's going to take to start to turn the squad over, right? Um that is a that is the the kind of the situation as of now, and so you know they they put this thing out, and and I know that they put this thing out here, which has been well documented and reported, and uh, I think we talked about it last time because it came out around the same time about uh, basically all these players being available, right? Um, these players being available, it doesn't mean everybody is is for sale. They're not trying to sell every single player, but that a lot of players are available. Uh, and the way that it was put to me is, you know, effectively, if you look at it, like most summers clubs are trying to hold on to a lot of their players and actively pursuing sales for a few. So they'll be reaching out and saying, is that, you know, are you interested in this player? Are you interested in this player? Um, it's a bit different in this one. It, effectively, the message that Ineos have put out there is that you've got all these players available, like <laughs> 20 out of 25 players in the squad are available, Right. Um, and by available, it means if you're interested, come to us, see if the player is interested in moving to you and give us an offer. And what they're going to essentially look at that and say, here's the minimum cost we'll take for each, any of these players um, to sell them, right? Because they're not making Rashford available. And then someone comes in and bids 20 million and they sell Rashford for him. It's going to be, you know, maybe 75 million or something like that, whatever they deem, you know, uh, the proper fee that would allow them to buy and replace and, and is, you know, uh, tied into the value of the player. Whereas for someone like Casemiro, maybe it's quite a bit less because getting the wages off the books, of course, is a big factor and all of that. So someone comes in and gives them anything, but takes the wages off, they might accept it um, just as an estimate, you know, Ericsson is probably the same thing. And so it, it's a little bit different where rather than specifically shopping a few players that they're really looking to get out, um, they're saying we're not, you know, stuck with the idea that any of these guys have to be here next season beyond a few. Go ahead. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like to me it was a throwaway comment by somebody. But yeah, we probably yeah. listen to the for all those players. I just right. don't see how, first of all, it would benefit any of us or uh, the football club to put that out there. Um, if you want to make a player available, you speak to the agent. And say, mm -hmm. okay, listen, yeah. you know, if you want to go solicit offers for your client, um, this is the price range with which we yep. would accept offers. And then the agent go does their job in private. Um, but once you have to start, you know, advertising, you know, that you're having players up for sale rather than people approaching you, mm. then um, you have a problem. And uh, I think it has the opposite effect. I think, um, you know, if Clubs should be approaching you for your players. You shouldn't need to be putting them on the market and soliciting offers and advertising offers. You know, their, their talent should be doing that themselves. Because um, it, it, it just sounds like to me someone from any of us probably had a casual conversation, threw that in there without really thinking about it. And then, of course, that could turn into a story. Um, because to me, it just sounds too uh, too broad, too generic. Though so we'll accept listing the offers for pretty much anyone with the exception of the young players. You know, and that may well be true, um, but, uh, you know, selling clubs usually don't have to solicit offers for top players. 
I mean, Spurs didn't have to tell the market they were selling Harry Kane. Right? Um, the, the, they'll come to you. Uh, so to me, I think um, I, I just don't see how that's smart business. There's been a couple of things where I've looked at and went, hmm, I didn't understand why Radcliffe decided to make it personal with Newcastle over Ashworth. Mm. So inevitably it would provoke a response from people who have the money to be able to pay Ashworth to sit in his behind. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to, to turn around and say, okay, you wanna you you wanna taunt us in public about you know how how we have to do this, then let me show you why we don't. I just don't understand that. I they could criticize Ken Hogg with going public about Jaden Sancho. Mm-hmm. You know, I just don't understand what the benefit is yeah. of that. Um uh, especially three, four days after the window just closed. I just, I, I think maybe it would have been better not to say anything at all and make it easy for Newcastle to let him go rather than make it harder. And, um, you know, I would caution people at any us because they're an experienced two teams if yep. you're on a football club at this level. So they're not really going to make mistakes. I would really caution any us about making those types of leaks to people and turn them into stories. Yeah, well, I understand the intention behind it because the intention behind it is is true. I don't think there are many players at United that any of will look at and say they're a, you know a fulcrum of the team. They're a mainstay well, you know, of the team. Someone's approaching it because that story was in the media because oh now those players are available. Let me call Manchester United. Yeah, and they're gonna know via the agents. You know they are. They're gonna know via agents if the players are available. And sure. and and obviously the intention behind it as well as you know is in in more real terms is that if a player wants to leave they'll be willing to get offers for them and to listen to offers for them you know but don't you uh, communicate that to the agents first yeah and I, and I'm yeah I agreed and and I would I would guess that uh I would bet that you know based on some of the things we've talked about that you know it's it's more in that vein like people knowing that players kind of knowing that their future at United is, is in their hands to some degree, right? If they want to leave, then they will do that. If they want to stay. Does that, then... does that not concern you that being done through the media? Because this to me, again, goes back it does, to... it, it does in, in respect, right? Because I, I agree because I, I would, the more quiet they are, I think the better. And I do wonder why it gets out into the media because what they're doing or intending to do makes a lot of sense. And, and, and I heard a long, long before the story came out, the intention of, you know, them not looking at the squad and saying, Oh yeah, we've got a bunch of stars and we're going to hold on to, to everybody we possibly can and make very few changes. I, I don't know why the story necessarily came out when it did or, or why. Um, yeah. I, uh, there's things I, I think we, like we talked about, we'd like to be more publicly stated. Um, and things that it doesn't totally make sense to be publicly stated because, of course, what does that say to players and things when the season is ongoing if that's not the communication that they've been told, right? That, oh, you know, if they're being told it's different, you know. That's what I was going to say is that, you know, I didn't speak to all of them, but some of these players' representatives are like, you know nothing about this. Yeah. Uh, To me, you know, obviously Ten Hag denied it in the media. Um but this kind of goes back to the Ten Hag thing for me in that have the balls to communicate directly, right? right. Not, don't don't be leaking this type of stuff through the media um, and directly about players. If you have any, if you if a player, if you want to listen to an offer for a player, tell the representatives. So yeah. look, you know, I'm not saying that he's going to leave, but if you if you know this is what we would accept if you know if an offer came in for your client, we would accept it. Or but. You can't have it both ways. You can't mm-hmm. well, leak us the media and say we'll accept the offers for certain players, but we're not actually going to tell them that because what if we don't get offers and then they, you know, they're we'll have to go back and eat humble pie. As you needed have had to do many times before. I yeah, mean, well, you brought up the Sancho situation, and I think that was an example of that where well, I, I mean, believe that. We're going to send yeah. a blog and send a tummy. Actually, you know what? We're not. Now we need you. And I just, yeah. I think that like, okay, you have to be direct with players and their and their representatives and tell them exactly what's going on. And mm-hmm. you know, yeah. 
maybe they say to you, I want to leave. They don't get a move. They come back. Okay. Sometimes that happens, but yeah, I, I don't, that being in the media and the players not knowing about it, I, I think that's a bit naughty. Yeah, it is. And, and I think that their, their intentions on what they're doing are probably fine. Um, but you know, obviously one of the things that's going to change under this, that I think as, as, as fans, you get these kind of shakeups from time to time in, in reading the media and, and understanding kind of what's going on is, um, I mean, things change when, when people come in and new people come in and this and that, and you've got all new people and all new contacts and all new executives and all new this and that, you know, things start coming out differently in different ways at different times. I think that for Ineos, it'll probably be a focus to shut those up quite a bit, just based on the way that they do things. Um, you know, there's there's many many times where something where the where there's good intentions, but something comes out through a casual conversation or somewhere else, and becomes um, more clumsy in how it's presented in comparison to, you know, what was intended by it or something like that. Because it is a different statement to say what I was heard what I heard originally, which is that, that like there's only a few players who are safe is how I heard it originally months and months ago, which is a different statement to saying there's 22 players for sale. You know, there is a difference between those three, you know, those, those subjects. And um, because saying that players are, are, are safe is saying we won't listen to offers for them. Whereas, um, you know, saying that for sale, you're more actively encouraging offers for yeah, them. Right? I just think that's something you have a conversation that does never, yeah. never in public. I think that yeah. you can, maximize the impact of that decision with a private conversation and mm -hmm. you know for you, you and i and for everyone else this is just you know speculation that makes podcasts and stuff but for the people involved this is their job this is their life yeah. and mm -hmm. this this has a different impact i mean there was a thing that any of us did uh about two weeks ago a week and a half ago no more working at home um everyone mm -hmm. has to go back into the office there's not enough office space and then this you know, internal leak about any of us, Jim Radcliffe being really upset over the state of the IT department. I mean, I think these are a bit naughty, to be honest. So let's say the IT department is a mess, right? I wouldn't blame low-level staff for that. Mm -hmm. I would blame the fact that that's a consequence of the complete decay of standards and incentives inside United proper management to make sure this isn't the case. Um, yeah. You know, let me ask you something. Let me ask you something on that, Phil, because I think one of the original people who put that out, and this isn't knocking on him at all, is Adam Crafton at The Athletic. Mm -hmm. He's gotten a lot of executive leaks over the last year, well before mm -hmm. Ineos had been in there. And I'm still asking who's doing that and why. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still wonder. I, I'm not making an accusation of him or anything for him reporting things like that in the slightest. But I still wonder because it started with a little bit before the Mason Greenwood situation, right? Yeah. And suddenly every meeting, every discussion, everything that was going through certain executive high level stuff was started to be leaking out there. And so there's a little bit of separating this because we know there was some, there has been a lot of, um, what was the word for it? Like dis perhaps potential discontent with Ineos coming in last year as well. Um, through some of the higher levels also. And one of the things I do get concerned about is that until you've, which is one of the reasons you end up getting a lot of people replaced uh, in a takeover, is wondering yeah. who's trustworthy and who's not. You know, when you look at it to say, are these things being put out there? What is being put out there via Ineos and what is being leaked out there purposefully, you know, put a certain way? Uh, and I wonder, I wonder about these types of things, you know, quite, quite often, um, because that's kind of the culture you've had at United for a long time is, is a lot of, of executives and people who are very self-serving, um, you know, with, with the people who are in there under the glazers that weren't qualified for the, for the position. Oh, no, they made so many decisions that were self-serving and, and in self-interest. And, and I do kind of wonder what, why are these things coming out and continue to come out? Yeah, look, this has been a problem at United for forever. And this is exactly what happens when you have individuals who end up going to work for a club and realize that it's all about me. That it's really, there's no no one being compensated here based on a collective team effort 
Um, so if people start working towards your own agendas, and you know, once that culture sets in, you either leave because you don't like it, or you're attracted to it, like moth to a flame. And uh, so, eventually, after a few years, you become so far removed from what your job should be that you don't even notice. You know, you live on a farm, you stop smelling shit after a day, and this yeah. is exactly what, what what goes on at this football club. And anyone else should know at this point. Um, who's who's trustworthy and who's not mm. um, because one thing that you will always get in companies is you will always get um informants right <laughs> so yeah uh if anyone you know people will be self-servant oh my my work colleagues sent me you know to this person this person give me a raise because i just crossed on my man yeah. so there once any of us provide incentives for you know to to find out leaks They'll find out who they are pretty quickly. They're not complicated. I mean, um, there is clearly people inside the football club that don't want any of us there. But if I'm Ratcliffe and that thing that Adam Craft and email comes out, I'd be really upset mm -hmm. because that yeah. is an internal email mm -hmm. and that is something that I would really hope was directed at department heads. But first of all, if I see something like that, I'm sitting in my department down going, why is it like this? Mm -hmm. I guess because you know, for 10 years, we've had no oversight. No one's actually compensated us or incentivized us. I could have this room spotless and I won't yeah. get promoted. I, I'm not being paid for this. You know, mm -hmm. my hours are cut back, all this, whatever, yeah. right? Is there not a cleaning department? Well, was there, there's probably a really good reason why it's a shit hole um, yeah. because it's a, it's a reflection of the lack of leadership from top down who yeah. don't have you know, reward and incentive consequence reward structure. So, yeah, to me, like, um, you know, the under 23 dressing rooms and stuff for a mess. And, you know, again, I would be, you know, everything thing you need to do is a mess. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so the fact that they don't have enough staff and they don't invest in excellence and they don't have standards. Yeah. You know, what, what's that IT department under 23 dressed and not it's just a microcosm of everything through the whole mm -hmm. football club and uh if i'm management i'm looking at a way to fix that rather than a way to blame yeah i mean it's uh you know it's as above so below in some respects you know um and that applies with a lot of things and and if you think of the management as kind of the uh you know the brain of everything then what you see on the on the exterior and at the bottom is entirely a consequence um you know of, of the thinking from above and when the thinking from above is about lower standards Absolutely. that's exactly what you get on the bottom and they are yeah. to blame 100 percent. now my personal take on it all is that obviously this is a mess that's going to take a while to sort out um <laughs> internally because that you know the dereliction we see on the pitch is tenfold behind and off the pitch right um the issues that we see the mess you see on the external you know, is usually the tip of the iceberg, as they say, of course, for, for what's underneath and behind it. And it's going to be messy and difficult to take. And, uh, you know, when you see people in, in high executive positions departing out of the blue, um, it's not an accident. It's There's reasons for it. And some of these things like, you know, the work from home, the email, these types of things, uh, I wouldn't be very surprised if to some, if not to some degree, but pretty blatantly the goal isn't to weed out people who can't deal with it right from a standard perspective and yeah some of it does unfairly fall upon uh lower staff and things like that but i also definitely know right or wrong and this isn't agree this isn't about agreeing or disagreeing with these things but just the, the reality of it that Ineos perspective is they have probably multiple hundred too many employees where a lot of them are not doing really anything they're just there because they have a job you get in, in a lot of companies and an enormous number of middle managers that are effectively pretty useless i'm not talking about the people who are you know making the food at the stadium and you know doing the tickets and things like that but you get a lot of middle management um a lot of people in the the mid to lower levels that end up kind of <laughs> just by default yeah, continuing to exist and not producing anything of note or quality for the the job and and i'm quite you know and you've seen that reflected in some of the reports that it's a bit of a suspicion of like you know is 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 this a little bit over the top but being done for the purpose of saying we want to know who really 
gives a shit about this, who has the standards to be here and who's coasting along because you're going to get people who will quit. I'm not saying this is the best way to go about it, but you're talking about a, you know, a guy who runs a $76 billion business. And I can tell you that uh, they can be absolute bastards, you know, and I think people should know this. Um, they can be absolute bastards when it comes to business um, and when it comes to finance and when it comes to staffing and things like that. And, and I would not be surprised at all to see, you know, further things pushed until almost to forcibly cut costs. They may want people to quit. I'm not making that as an accusation. I'm just saying that's my take on it, that they may strongly want people to, to quit. And to say, well, if they if they can't deal with that, then this isn't what we want here. Um, that's a lot of people like that's approach to business. You see it in other mergers and acquisitions all the time. They come in, they start changing a bunch of policies, and the goal is that they can get 20, 30% of the staff to leave. And they feel that they'll be more yeah. productive with fewer people. I think you can do that where in businesses where the only goal is profit. Mm -hmm. if, if I take over you know, a, a bank, and the only magic of success is profits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people to me are an accountant. You know, uh, they're, a mar they're, they're, they're a, a, a margin in, in my accounting uh, my, yep. my books. You know, it's a collective cost. Okay, you know, I want to swim my stuff and what have you. Yep. But football clubs are a bit different. And I understand there's a business side to this that has to be run like a business. Um, but the owners of the football club are not anonymous, like a lot of big business owners are. I mean, who you know, most big business owners you never see they're anonymous, and yeah. you have an expectation that they're purely profit driven. For any of us, you know, they're still in the point where you know it's but uh, you know, if you look at their statement whenever they were trying to take over United. You know about making it back to being a community club and all that and i still think they have a duty of care to the people that are there to treat them responsibly and forcing people to quit it sits uncomfortably with me and because yeah. is that what they're trying to get ten hog to do right you know is that what the, is that what this is about have the balls to make a decision if you want people, if, if you think you've got too many staff, turn around with staff and say, we're going to lay you off. We're going to give you a month's severance or whatever. You know, but forcing people to quit at the very bottom, I, I don't like it. I think that there's a way to do things that has respect for people. If there's nothing wrong with you doing a, an internal audit and valuation and saying, we have, you know, we're, 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 we need to cut 30% of our staff. Okay, then do it right. Sit down with those people, give them a severance package, give them notice, and you can't look at everything like a cost. You know, there has to be, to me, still some humanity in how you run a business. And surely, you know, it, players' wives were out last week getting gifts, gifts lavished on mm. them. Why can't they do that with the regular staff? Why, right now, probably the last people I would be investing in is players' wives, right? I mean, if you're, if you're turning around and saying, we can't afford to give you a £2,000 severance package, but we can afford to give players waves, you know, a party, I, I, I doesn't sit with me, James. I, I, I love any of us here, and I, and I know that a lot of these decisions are going to be unpopular, but I still don't think they should get, you know, a, a free pass. And when they do shitty things, they should be called out on it. Maybe they're not going to do this, but if they do stuff like that, where they create an environment that forces people to quit, rather than create an environment that gives people the choice. Do you want to work here or not? It's okay. You know, rather than force, I'm going to give you a choice. It, 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 you know, Ten Hag, if, you know, is he getting a chance to prove to keep his job? Then why doesn't other people? If you think you've got too many staff, cut them. Or if you want to see if they'll work under certain conditions, ask them. You know, and I, I don't know. I think to me, it's um, if they choose, if they say yes and don't do it, then second. But I, I don't like creating a condition where you're forcing people to quit. Yeah, and like I said, I don't. Yeah, uh, it's I not ne necessarily <laughs> my you know agreement with it, but you know, uh, where, where in a regular business that they would be looking at it for profit, right? Um, Ineos profit is how much they can spend on the football side of the club, right? 
And one of the problems that they've definitely, that we're running into right now is not FFP in terms of we've spent too much of a percentage of our income. It's about loss. Um, it's losses. And so if the business is losing, you know, lost 100 million in 21-22, right? Or 2021, I think it was, right? Um, and then the business lost 50 million and the business is going to lose 50 million this year. Well, how do you fix the losses? Because yeah, the goal is to be competitive, right? Then you either, well, you cut football spending, which is the bulk of it. Well, that's not going to make you more competitive, right? To spend less on football costs. You increase revenue, which I'm sure they're going to do and try to do as much as is possible, right? And sponsorship deals, things like that. That's why Blanc is in there right now. That's what Barada will be working with them on the stadium. This is all to raise revenue, right? To, to be able to spend more money and to not have these losses. And the third thing is saving money on administration. not on, Yes, on football by being more efficient, but the goal isn't to spend less on football, right, in the long term. It's to spend more but get more out of it. Um the administrative costs are certainly an area we've seen a lot of articles and things detailed that they feel that's too much money. Well, unfortunately, that administration includes absolutely everything, <laughs> you know, everything outside of football, all those thousand plus employees, all the things, the trips to Wembley, the all of it. Um, and it's it's just not surprising yes, to me right. that this is, yes. yeah, all of it. Yeah. Um, but they may look at it and say, well, that's a that's a twenty thousand dollar investment in in team spirit, versus uh, for football players, which is more important than your average guy working at the club. Again, I'm just saying it's it's to me it's obvious that that's the way that they think because that's the way that they're acting, um, and I'm just not surprised by it at all. I kind of expect it to get worse on that respect before it gets Look, better. You have to cut your cloth accordingly. There's no question about that. If you come to the conclusion, you have budget uh, allocations for each department, um, and if you think you know the budget uh, uh, department's too heavy and needs to to, to need to cut staff, that's fine. There's a way to do it, and the way not to do it is to force people to quit so you don't have to pay them a severance, because I think that is unethical, and right. I don't think that, I don't think that produces long-term returns. I think yeah. that uh, you create an environment where people want to work, not where people don't want to work. Um, because to force someone to quit, you have to get shit work out of them for a while, right? Because mm -hmm. they're not just going to wake up one day and go, I'm going to quit. You have to mm -hmm. put them through the grinder for a while. And if you've already decided they shouldn't be here for budgetary reasons, then you've already decided whether there, there's no job they can do that's going to save them. And yep. so that to me is, you know, I, I, I don't understand that. Why don't you just take the individual in? Why don't we go to Joel and Aubrey Glazer and say, you know, instead of paying for your flights over to the FA Cup final, we're going to give our staff a severance package. Instead of paying millions and millions and millions to rein and, um, and for your legal fees and everything else, we can afford to pay our staff. Because if you look at what you need losses, the heavy losses have come over the years. It's in service and debt. Yeah. It's in recruitment and mm -hmm. how they pay and how they, yeah, it's in wages to players. Before you get to the low level admin stuff, you're way down the list. So there's, a, there's just one cost they could cut that would cover doing it right. And to me, the dividend of doing it right. Um, you're also when you do stuff like that, you're also sending a message to the staff that are staying that if you know this is how you're going to lose your job. Uh, how you buy and sell players also sends a message to the players that you have. Mm -hmm. This is when we think we you're of no longer service. Yes, this is what we're going to do. So what happens when an employee gets a, a decent offer that's slightly better than the one they got? You know, and I'm out of here because these yeah. people once they decide that you're of no, no longer used to you, this is the culture of the company, they cut you. So you don't get loyalty. So when you treat people purely as a transaction, as a, as a cost benefit, they will treat you the same. So um, if I'm just a cost on an accountancy sheet, then you are just a cost on mine. So as soon as I get yeah. a slightly better offer, I might, I don't know. I, I just think that you have to get people to buy into what you're doing as well. And one of the problems that United have had one of the problems that Chelsea have had is this latter issue, is that it's seen purely as a check. 
Mm -hmm. So they're not motivated by a goal beyond the remuneration. And that's exactly yeah. what you get when you don't have any decency to human beings. You know, well, that's, yeah. that's a transactional relationship. I would agree. And, and, and my personal view on it, again, is that it's mostly, to some degree, it's temporary. Because, I mean, ideally, it's temporary, right? Um, you know, because, uh, yeah, it, it's like, yeah, it's so bloated, <laughs> you know, this is such a bloated, I know, but look, I mean, look at it like to some degree, right? You have people complaining every day for the last 10 years about wasteful players on big wages yeah. and things like that. You know, to some degree, there is a level of, you know, and, and I, to be fair here, look, to, it, to some degree, I, this is this is going to come across way too capitalist of me. So I apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> but uh, to some degree, as a business owner, I know with how United have been run and with the employees in there, there's a lot of them. I'm not letting them off the hook to say they haven't been sitting there wasting their time and that they're being done wrong if they're being forced to quit. There's a lot of people who are like that in many businesses, especially ones that are failing. You know, just, I, just, just fathom. I hear you, but how? But I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I've never, I've never run a business. I've never run a business with 1,100 staff. You know, um, from a different country and all of that to say what is the most effective way they have a company, right? That's been doing an audit of the finances and the spending and all of that. Um, I'm not saying they're trying to force people to to quit. By, by doing this. I'm just saying that it may be almost an inevitability of it. Uh, he makes, you know, to, to be to be totally clear on this, you know, Ineos don't have a work from home environment in their own business. Yeah, so it, it may just be the way that they do things, you know, that they, they just want to, of course. Because these are people that are friends. These are people that are family. Yeah. These are people whose legs are intertwined. Yeah. And you start treating human beings like that and cut a department yeah. in half. Where it's it, it's you create an environment where people don't want to work to find out which ones yeah. don't work. Even the ones that do conform and do well, you're going to destroy their morale. And to me, I, I guess think, what's what's the I, difference? I the responsibility, but it has to be done. Yeah. Right. But, but what's I I agree. But what's the difference? Like in in some sense, at the end of the day, right? What is the difference between never overinflating the department by hiring too many people and just and cutting it back down to where it should have been in the first place. Oh, I think you think there's you can turn around to people and say, look, we just we, we will offer voluntary redundancies. Yeah. Maybe. Well, if, I hope they do, right? Like, I, I you're you know, right because the next yeah. the next step would be they probably are going to cut staff. I mean, I I so can't see a world where they don't, right? If you want to go, yeah, I would stop. like them to do they that. Care. You know, yeah. You don't have to do this. This is with the yeah. reality that we're faced with. Yes. We'll, we'll offer you redundancy. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a payoff. You can go. I mean, it, it ultimately what I, it would cost yeah. to do it right would be very little versus what well, it would do correct, it wrong. correct. And 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 I have a hundred percent hope that they do do it that way, and they should do it that way. I just think some of the things they're doing. You, if you're sitting there, you should be expecting that letter or that email or that thing to come down soon, saying, you know, this department is no longer going to function with this many people. And here's what we're offering in this sure. situation because the writing's on the wall. You know what I mean? And I yeah. hope they do it right. I, I don't I make that very, very clear. I really yeah. hope that it's not a situation where it's just like overnight, you know, they make some changes that force yeah, people I mean, to quit without, because I do think that's completely ridiculous. There is a right way of going about it. I think the yeah. outcome is going to be that no matter what, but I, but I do hope they go about it the right way. 100%. Yeah. I mean, Richard Arnold got his payoff. All the top boys get their yeah. payoffs. So why don't yeah. the right Give it to everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. No. And maybe that's part of the, the factor in this, you know, of looking at the finances of, of things to say, to save money in the long term, you know, we may have to pay out, you know, a few million dollars and severances yeah. and things like that to, to sort this and you know they've been willing like you said they've been willing to do that at the executive level to pay out yeah. Richard Arnold to I'm sure Murtaugh's getting a payout I'm sure Cliff Beatty and and um Patrick Stewart will be getting a severance on these types of things and and ideally you know the right way of doing it goes all the way down the line when they make these these cuts and but in the long term I'm sure it will be lean and and uh and not mean but in an effective way but I, I'm sure it will be will be leaner than it is. All right, Michael Willie, say my man, had a very good performance last night. Just so we're clear, 
I wasn't, I'm not, I don't doubt Elise's talent. What I doubt is whether in a Ten Hag team, um, yeah. where he would play, if he would play that centrally um, because of the way his way players play. Um, I agree with you on that. Um, yeah. Also, because like I said, they still have major question marks to answer over who's going to drop out for him to play. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Played very well tonight, uh, last night. Um, you know, still some question marks about his injury record. Um, uh, seems like there's a lot of teams that are interested in him. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, if he's saying for United, and he was playing for United last night, do you think he would have played that way? <laughs> Not yesterday, but that being said, I'll say one thing, and, and it's the reason why specifically I really like Michael Lise, um, in particular when you watch him. And if you, the more you watch him, the more you'll notice it. Um, mentally, I, I, how do I put this? He looks like he's never going out of first gear, but I say that as a positive. He's incredibly composed and calm and confident. And it's been that way his entire career that I've watched him, you know, at Palace as far as I've seen him. He's got um, a very, you know, he he obviously is a player who has an enormous amount of belief in himself um, and some unshakable confidence. And it's a player that I think is ready for a move to a big club and would handle it because it takes a, you know, there's players that aren't. And we've seen that, I think, certainly one of the biggest issues with United's recruitment and certain players is mentally they're not there. They're not confident. They do not have that strength and that fortitude, um, especially when we're talking about the right wing position because ahead of him, you're talking about Jaden Sancho who really struggled with that. And I'm not blaming him. I'm just saying it as a factor of life um, that had a lot of trouble you know, with the confidence and things like that. Uh, Anthony, who uh, you have to have big question marks over certain aspects of his mentality. You know, you need it. You need someone with that um, surety, and and uh, and I think you would bring that. I think you get more consistency from a player who doesn't fall into the highs and lows so much, um, and is is very uh, regular. And obviously, you know, when you get to a big club, that can change. But it is something that is well known about him: is that confidence that he has. It's a it's a it's a very very notable trait. And one that I think is very admirable, and and a big focus, in my opinion, for players that they bring in should be that aspect of it. You know, their mentality is something that can be often overlooked. You know, their confidence. Yeah, I think one of the problems with United is it's that mentality has been a problem mm-hmm. because um, the the club has never matched that ambition. Yes. And so when players come to United with that mentality, I'm thinking Ronaldo. That yeah. that mentality. Of we must win, will eventually become toxic in a club that doesn't think they must win. Yeah, and this is all. With, with winners are the worst people to have around your football club or your business when you don't share their ambition because they're mm-hmm. grumpy, they're pain in the eyes, they don't, they're actually not motivated to finish in the fourth. But this is why Brighton players, you know, can play except you know finish seventh or eighth and look amazing because they don't lose confidence when they lose two, three games. They are still motivated yeah. to finish. In you know Europa Conference League, but you bring in players like Casemiro. I, mean, I don't think Casemiro has a mentality issue. I think he has a motivational issue. I think yeah. obviously you know he's being played in different positions. You want to kill a player's confidence. You ask them to spend a significant amount of time in a game doing things they're not good at. Right? I don't. So you know when you get to United's second, third season under the manager, they're forced to become practical. Marcus Rashford has to play as a left midfield. Uh, he's miles away from goal when he's picking up the ball because he's got a cover for a left back who you know who who isn't the left back. Um, maybe it's Victor Lindelof one week, maybe it's Ambon Bissaka one week, maybe it's Dallo the next week, maybe it's Regulon, you know, maybe it's Amrabat, and you know, right winger. You know, it all depends on who's on the right hand side. You know, um, I think uh, with United, that mentality is great if the football club matches your ambition. Yep. Next season is going to be a tough season because any of us are going to get criticized next season. Mm-hmm. You're going to see, I'm telling you, it's going to take about two weeks before any of us are fraud. You know, they're, you know, they're the Glazers, you know, just disguised us because they'll get inevitably, they'll get signings wrong, they'll get some decisions wrong. I mean, you already have people telling them because they haven't sacked and hugged. Yeah, yet. I know. Right? <laughs> 
But, but not, in saying that, I'm not saying they shouldn't sing prayers with that mentality. I'm saying yeah. you only sing prayers with that you mentality have to if you are mm -hmm. going to match that ambition. Otherwise, right. yeah, you are too much. I mean, if I'm going for Cristiano Ronaldo and I'm saying, wait a minute, Cristiano Ronaldo is an absolute winner. We bring him here to finish yeah. in the top four. This is going to kick off in here because he's not going yeah. to tolerate it. This is yep. such a predictable outcome. You know, Rafael yep. Varane doesn't have a mentality problem where you can't win the European Cup. City does. You know, to me, I think, um, you know, that mentality is great if you match the ambition. Casemiro last season was amazing when he were going for the Champions League and a Cup final. Um, yeah. We scored the goal away to Bournemouth. We got them in the Champions League, scored the next game at, at the home to Chelsea. Yep. But, you know, yep. asking these players to get motivated for Europa Conference League. Yep, 100%. And that's why I'm saying I want those players because I want the club to actually match it, you know, and they have to, or it won't work. They absolutely have to. Yeah. Um, okay, Matt, uh, we'll go ahead and leave it there. Um, thanks to all of you for downloading the podcast. Uh, do you have anything else you want to add before I, before I go? No, again? that's good. That should do it. Well, um, what's your prediction for now the rest of the season? You're thinking they will win a game of football? No, I don't. I honestly don't. I don't, I don't think you have hope in hell against, you know, Arsenal. Newcastle are finding their form. Um, yeah, I don't think we have a hope in hell of winning a game. <laughs> Even, I mean, I know just quickly, if you needed to lose the next three games, which I think they will, it would be simply impossible for any of us to keep Ten Hag. Yeah, I mean, you mean at the end of the season or you mean before the cup final? It's, it's, no, even at the end of it. I just yeah, think yeah. Like, even as most devout supporter, yes, we're, you know, our decisions are driven by emotion sometimes, but mm. it would be I, very difficult for him even to retain the confidence of the players because it looks to me like those players are presenting themselves to. Yeah. And I, you can criticize them too, they deserve to be. Yeah. But, um, I don't see, and it's a, it's a problem because you're not replacing 25 players over the course of a summer. Of course, you're coaching the majority of the same players next year, and if they've given yeah. up on you, it's really hard to get a road back from that. Whether they deserve the criticism, which they do, it's not separating that. It is really hard to come back from that. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Okay, we'll see what happens, folks. Uh, thanks to all of you for downloading the pod as always, and the follows, and the likes, and the retweets, and all that. Much appreciated. Yes. And uh, we'll see you back next week. Take it easy, man. Yeah.